With 15 presidents and head of state in the past six decades, how has Nigeria fared after independence? I'm joined now by lawyer and human rights activist Abbas Ahmed on the countdown. Thank you for joining us on the program this evening. You know, the issue of whether or not Nigeria is divided along ethnic and religious lines is still a relevant conversation and it's been further pronounced by the recent election. Uh, the question would be, how did this linger for 62 years with 15 presidents and heads of state in between? What did we miss? Hello. Mr. Ahmed, if you can hear me, I'm asking that how... Yeah. Yes, exactly. If you can hear me, please just go ahead. That um, why are we um, this divided and fractured along ethnic lines? Absolutely. Um, thank you. I think from my own perspective as a student of um, Nigeria's history, the reason why we find ourselves in a nation that is so blessed with both material and uh, human capital is simply because our leaders have failed us one way or the other. That's just simple. I mean, that's how simple I can put it. It's failure of leadership. Are you saying, failure. Are you saying Mr. Abbas, that um, Nigeria yeah. has consistently in the past 62 years have leaders who, you know, did not meet up with expectation. There are no exceptions at all when you look at the list. I'm not saying I will not. I will not sit here to to generalize that we've not had brilliant leaders, um, like the likes of Chief Obafemi Awolowo, Murutala Mohammed, Michael Adekule Ajasi, Alaji Latif Ajakandi, Amin Okanu, Sardauna, Tafa Balewa, Cheu Shagari, Alese Kweme. They were brilliant leaders. They went into government, they were not corrupt, never stole money because there's no record that they stole money. They did their best. But with the exception of these few, the rest have actually seen the corridors of power as an opportunity to accumulate wealth and use states, um, I mean, the, the, the state. We may have to return to that conversation in the course of this program and also follow up with... Um, instructing. Mr. Abbas, we lost you for a minute, but I guess you were talking about how, you know, the good leaders uh, were a function of exception. Yeah, they were, they were, they, yes, they were exception rather than the rule. It was supposed to be a general rule. That you uh, good leaders will constantly emerge and drive development, but what you we, what we have in Nigeria is that those good leaders come in accidentally, mm. and so Nigeria Nigeria has actually experienced more of bad leadership than good leadership, and so every ethnic group is clamoring for their persons to be there because they simply believe that until someone from my from my tribe becomes the president. I'm not sure that there will be development. When you say the presidency, for example, in all the states, whether for governorship, for house of rep, house of assembly, you constantly see people clamoring for it is the, it is the turn of the North, Sen uh, 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 North Senatorial District. It is the turn of the Northwest. It is the turn of Southeast. It is the turn of Southwest. It is even within Southwest, you will see people clamoring. It is the turn of the Jebus, it is the turn of the Ebbas and things. So it's a failure of leadership. It's a failure of leadership. That's why we find ourselves here. If the leaders have led very well and everybody is experiencing development, mm. nobody will be clamoring for where, um, I mean, insisting that they want their person, a, a, a leader from their tribe or their ethnic group to mm. be the leader. We must be very honest with ourselves. But that how come... Reality. How come, We've not had just a minute, how come our system has not evolved in such a way that it automatically ejects bad leaders? How come we're still counting on individuals to make it work? 
Um, the, the, the reason is not is not the far fetched. You see, the, a, a nation must allow their political structure and institution to evolve. Now, when we were going into independence, we had the independence constitution of 1960. After test running the constitution of 1960, the frontline leaders, the Obafemi Awolowos, the Aziki Waves, the Saudowners, the Amadou Belus, came to the realization that a society that is conceived that consists of several ethnic and multi-religious entities should be governed under a federal structure. And we adopted the American federal structure, regionalism, that people should develop at their own pace. So we had the 1963 constitution, sorry, that institutionalized regionalism, allowing people to evolve at their own pace. And if you look at what transpired then was, there was a healthy competition between all the regions. You had the Northern region, the Western region, the Eastern region. The Western region trailed the place educationally, established University of Ife. East, looked across the border and decided to set up University of Nigeria in Soka. The North, not wanting to be left alone, decided to set up the Ahmed Ubele University to rival these two institutions in the South. Mm. They were, each region was developing at its pace. For example, Awolowa decided to say, look, human capital development will be my topmost priority. Development of my human capital. He made education a priority, free and compulsory, to the extent that it was even a criminal offense. Parents were being threatened to be jailed for not sending their children to school because there was no, no reason. The school was free. You were not paying. All you were required to do is register your children. You know, I have heard but that argument the that um, at the time it was easy for the region to develop at their own pace. But I would like us to just um, quickly consider the role you think um, military has played in all of these since, for instance, the military yeah, interruption. Going. In 1966. That's why I'm going. That you yes. see, when the military intervened in 1960, they disrupted and distorted this political structure, this regionalism that was put in place by the leaders, having interrogated the the the, the, the constituent components, parts. Mm. They were able to interrogate and came to the conclusion that if we are to develop, each region should go their step, I mean, should do things convenient for them. Then the issue of foreign affairs, uh, defense, monetary policy should be centralized. And when regionalism was there, what the regions were expected to do was to contribute to the maintenance of the federal structure for maintenance of our foreign affairs, you know, monetary policies, defense, and all the rest of them. But when the military came, they disrupted everything, Indeed. centralized everything. So now we are actually running a distorted federalism. I hear you. And the honest truth is that, except you go back yes. to restructure and allow people to have confidence and being able, because the way and manner we hold the president responsible for virtually everything that happens in one village in Anambra, and in Ogun State, one remote area, everybody is calling the president mm. because the president's table, the exclusive list, is too loaded. You know, there is the perception uh, that um, Nigeria has been led mostly by people from the military stock, except for, say, uh, Sheu Shagari, who was a teacher. There was Ernest Shuneko, a lawyer. And then, more recently, Umar Yara doing good luck, Jonathan. And this is perhaps the first election where none of the top contenders have a significant military background. It's also the first time we have two senators as president and vice president elect. Uh, do you think this will significantly change anything in terms of, uh, say, democratic values, human rights, and the rule of law? You know, as a human being, you must constantly, and as a nation, 
you must constantly invite optimism as a virtue. Because the capacity and the capability of the human race to constantly surmount the most horrendous challenge is phenomenal. There is absolutely nothing impossible with strong political will, with a team that is visionary enough to harness the collective intelligence, the resilience, the passion, the dexterity of the Nigerian people. There is absolutely nothing. If the leadership is honest and truthful, selfless, because most of the challenge we have in Nigeria today, you have leaders who see public office as an opportunity to line their pockets, whether at the legislative level, whether at the executive level. Vast majority of those we have had in the time past were people who saw politics as business. If these ones that have been elected will decide to shun corruption and use the resources of the state to expand economic opportunities, reinvest our resources in expanding the economic opportunities within Nigeria and develop the economy to the extent that Nigerians will feel the impact of government, then they would have done very well. Because I, use, I, I, I often tell people, the problem we have in Nigeria is like having a pilot that you contracted to fly you from Lagos to Abuja. And he ended up flying you into Sambisa forest and insisting and convincing you at gunpoint that you should admit that Sambisa forest is actually Abuja. The leadership will constantly roll out, you know, figures, facts and figures as to how the economy is developing, how the people are being, you know, uh, 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 being, um, how the people are recipients of the dividends of democracy, their life is getting better, and the people are looking right, left, and center and say, how? And the leadership is trying to convince the people that your life is better off. When you actually develop an economy and a state and a nation, you govern them effectively. You do not need to, you do not need propaganda. They will know of their own accord. They will testify. The mechanic on the street will be able to testify. The market woman will be able to testify. But if you read out figures, based, on, figures based on what they have experienced, that does not have direct impact on the life of the people, then you will be finding it very difficult to convince the people. I get your point very clearly, <laughs> Mr. Abbas. Um, there are some who have also highlighted the issue of unity as key for the incoming administration. But I'd like us to just quickly consider the unwritten agreement of power rotation between the North and South, which was uh, the bone of contention pre-election. We saw how it fractured the major opposition party, the PDP. Do you share the same optimism uh, when you consider what has happened? Uh, do you think it's a plus and an improvement for the nation that perhaps um, when you see the stakeholders across board who stood for this position, is it proof that the days of sheer nepotism you know, are gradually behind us. See, power rotation, federal character, they are all symptoms of an underdeveloped economy and, and underdeveloped states. I want to ask you, which of these politicians, when they get to the airport and they're about to board the plane, how many of them have taken time to find out whether the pilot is actually from their locality, their ethnic group? When they send their children or wife to hospitals, how many times have they actually insisted on finding out whether the medical doc doctor or the gynecologist in that, that is going to attend to their wife is actually from their village or their ethnic group? They, they, you, 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 you don't find it. 
But when it comes to politics, everybody insists it is rotation. It's the reason why people are clamoring. The reason why people are clamoring for we want rotation is simply that people did not feel the impact of government very well. You're saying that all government and has to do now is to perform and then the issue of um, ethnicity perform. will not be a thing. I'm afraid once that's all the time we have, Mr. Abbas. We'll, we'll definitely find time to continue let, this conversation. Let them perform. Once they perform, that's all. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Uh, lawyer and human rights, uh, human rights activist, Ahmed Abbas.